I want us to continue, uh, conclude with what we began last week, and I promise you this morning that um, we'll be, I'll definitely be going at a faster pace this morning than I was uh, last week. I do want to, to I do want to conclude this, um, this message this morning, but I want us to look this morning at how to get the most from your Bible in six steps. This wonderful book that we have, and I, I've really been praying, and and I was praying, Lord, I don't want this to be in our thoughts or in our in our in how we carry it out. Just a oh, a little six step, whatever. I really don't mean that, but the Lord has so strongly impressed my heart, especially in this year, that we He wants us to be people of His Word that come to His Word, and as we come to His Word, and as we give it time, and as we pray over it, and as we read it, that our lives are transformed into the image of Christ. And that will not happen, brothers and sisters, unless the Word of God becomes, parts of, becomes a part of our lives. If we approach this casually, if we approach this haphazardly, we, our lives will never be transformed. Our lives will never be changed. We will never grow up in Him. Don't you want to grow up in God? I do. I want to, and you may say, oh, Pastor Jen, you're a pastor. You're, you've grown up already. There's so much more I need to learn. There's, there are so many, not just learn, there's so many more areas where I need to grow and to become more like Christ, as we all, as, as do we all. And that will happen as we come to the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, as we, as we look into the Word of God and pray and obey, our lives will be transformed. So I want us to continue this morning. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, this wonderful book that God has given us, that God has inspired, that God has made powerful. It gives us life, direction, strength, builds faith, and it builds foundation in our lives. All Scripture, inspired by God. That, that Scripture that you look at and you think, that's inspired by God? Just hang on to it. At the right time and at the right place, the Holy Spirit will breathe life into that passage. You'll say, oh, God, that's why you put that in your word. That's for my life at this moment, at this time. All of these wonderful things. It's useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. And you know what I like about it? Don't stop there. Have you ever had people that tell you, that criticize you? You're wrong. You're this. You're bad. You're whatever. Have you ever had people like that in your life? I certainly have. How does that make you feel? <laughs> Thumbs down. <laughs> it's not a blessing to us, is it? People that just, you're this or you're that. The Word of God goes so much further. Look at what it says. It makes us realize what's wrong in our lives, but the Word of God doesn't stop there because God is so good and He loves us so much. What happens next? It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what? to do what is right. So the Word of God correctly applied in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit not only shows us, I have fallen short here, I don't measure up here, but it gives us a road map. It's an encouragement to us to bring change in our lives. And that's what we need. That's what we need. And that's what God does. So this wonderful book that we have, and God uses it to prepare and equip His people to do every good work. You know, I knew verse 17. I've, I've read that so many times. But the Lord, in the last week or two, has really impressed upon my heart that He uses His Word to prepare me for good works, that, for me to do, not for you, for me. And then He's going to use His Word to prepare you. Here's this book. Think of all the millions and millions of Christians in the world. And God individualizes His Word through the power of His Spirit for every single one of us to prepare us for what He has for us to do, where we are, when we are, and how we are. What a wonderful, wonderful privilege we have and tool we have in the Word of God. But to benefit us, this book has to get off the shelf and into our lives. It has to get off of your guilty to-do list. Do you ever have it on your guilty to-do list? I do. I should read my Bible. I must do this. And so we're looking at, as we began last week, how to get the most from your Bible in six steps. Now you may say, aren't there more? Are there more than six steps? Oh, there may be. 
But this is just a simple, I, I'm not doing an in-depth study, but this is a simple how to get the most from your Bible in, in six steps. You need to get a translation that is easy for you to read. And if you, as I said last week, if you don't have one, talk to Pastor Renee, talk to me. If King James is the language of your heart, go get a King James. It's not the language of my heart, although that's where I memorized many of my, uh, that's where a lot of my memory uh, memory memorization comes from because that's what we had when I was a child hundreds of years ago um, a long long time ago um, if another translation or another paraphrase is the language of your heart get that as well if you're going to do serious Bible study get a good serious Bible study a good serious Bible with a very careful translation but for general reading and study get one that, that is comfortable to you that as you read it it flows. That's one of the reasons we often use here at, at Lighthouse the New Living Translation because it flows very easily. It may not always be the most accurate in all the areas, but it flows very easily as does NIV. And this is the NIV and there are other ones as well. And get a Bible, as we said last week, get a Bible that you are willing to mark and you're willing to take notes in. I sometimes meet people that that have a Bible and they 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 wouldn't dream of putting a mark on it. They wouldn't dream of doing anything with it. Get a, get a Bible that you're not afraid to mark and underline and do things with um, so, that it will, so that you'll get the most benefit from it. So you get that. And then step one, what do we do? We talked about this last week. Very simply, read it through. And I don't mean by that start in Genesis and go to Revelation. What I mean very simply, and I told you I got this uh, from a, a, an Anglican bishop, I think in the four, 30s or the 40s, UK. Um, and he meant, in other words, just read. Start reading if you haven't read before. Don't be put off by all of the thousands of pages, but begin reading. What's a good place to begin? This is a review. When? John, but sometimes John, especially, it's, it has a lot, uh, it may be a little bit difficult. What's another good gospel? The Gospel of Mark, which is the Gospel of Action. It's one of the shorter gospels. Um, who wrote, who was inspired of God to write Mark? Who? Do you know that one? Okay, it came through Peter and was written down by John Mark, the young man that abandoned Paul at one point on the missionary journey. That should encourage you, right? Do you ever feel like I've blown it and God can't use me now? And yet God could use a young man who left Paul because it was too hard to be a missionary. And God used him to write the Gospel of Mark. That it came through the influence of, of Peter as well into his life. So Mark is a good place to start. But start somewhere. Don't just hit the Bible. How many of you, don't raise your hands, please, at night, you know you should read the Bible because you're a Christian. Okay. Ooh, Ezekiel. Ooh. Oh. <laughs> Psalms, much better. And then the next night you... Yeah. Acts, okay, Acts is okay. Brothers and sisters, start someplace, get a direction, and stay with it. We'd never get anywhere if we walked around Hong Kong the way we read our Bibles at times, right? Um, start somewhere and, and keep going in that direction and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you in a direction. Um, so get started on it. So read it through. Some of us sometimes feel, ah, Pastor Jen, I've, I've read the Bible before, but really it's boring to me. Please do not raise your hands. It's, it's kind of boring. I've tried, but I'm just not really interested. What does Peter say about that? 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk. It's the milk of the Word so that you will grow into a full experience. Now, for babies, there's no problem, is there? Mother's milk tastes good, usually, and they're happy to have it every day. But as adults, when we come to the Word of God, using this as an example, I want to encourage you to do something if you find the Word of God boring. And some of us do sometimes, don't we? We think it's, it's so different from anything else I read. It's not a novel. It's not a John Grisham this. It's not a romance. It's, although there's romance in here and there's mystery in here and there are all sorts of things in here. But what I want to challenge you in is this. And I really, I really mean this. I, I know I'm sort of talking and making some jokes, but I'm very serious about this. You 
can learn to develop a taste for the Word of God. If you've never read it very much before and you've just kind of looked at it you thought, ah, it's not really interesting to me, it's not appealing to me, then I want to challenge you for a few weeks or set yourself for a month, okay? I'm going to come to the Word of God and whether, I, whether it tastes good to me or not, I'm going to take some time to read it. Don't have to read ten chapters. Don't have to read five chapters. Try reading a chapter a day. But set yourself to it and say, like it or not, to my taste. Appealing or not, I'm going to. I'm going to try it. And I want to challenge you as you think about that. Think about how many other things in your life, the first time you tried it, the first time you tasted it, it wasn't your cup of tea, was it? You didn't really care for it, but you kept on, didn't you? And it became something that was meaningful to you. It became something that was important to you. You began to develop a taste. How many of you, you know what I'm going to say next, don't you, loved durian the very first time you tried it? Anybody? Oh, you're weird if you liked it the very first time. But most people try it one time, mm, not my thing. Try it again, mm, not so bad. Try it the third time and you're hooked, right? Usually takes about three times. Or blue cheese. Ew, you just haven't tried blue cheese enough. Melrose, do you like blue cheese? Love it. She brings it to my house every once in a while and the whole house gets smelly as we, as we, enjoy, as we enjoy blue cheese. Or, and some of you that are saying, ew, that's a Western thing. Huh, how about stinky tofu? Uh-huh, same thing. Did you love it the very first time? Maybe not. Or balut. <laughs> ah, now I'm speaking your language, right? Now I'm speaking your language. We joke about these things, but may I be very serious? When we come to the Word of God, it's the same thing. We can develop a taste for anything. I'm serious. We can develop a taste for anything. I challenge you, children of God, develop a taste for the Word of God. It will bring you more benefit than anything else in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. Develop a taste. So number one, read it through. Number two, here's the next step. Think it over, okay? So I'm, they're in easy phrases so that you can remember them. Number one, read it through. Number two, think it over. And what, does, what do we mean by this? Well, first of all, let's understand by what it, what it isn't. When we, when we talk about thinking it over, I am not talking about at the end of the day, when you have worked all day, when, you're, when you are low bat, your phone is right down around the 3%, you're in the red zone, your brain is in the red zone, you've been on the computer for the last three hours playing games, <laughs> or surfing the net, or Googling yourself, or other things like that, and you're so tired, and you say, but I know I should read. And you go into the Bible, and you get one or two verses, and you lie there, and shoo, it's immediately gone from your brain. You couldn't, if I, if you someone were to ask you a minute later, what did you read? Honestly speaking, you wouldn't know, right? Because it didn't really enter your brain at all. You just checked it off the list. Wash my face? Check. Brush my teeth? Check. Floss my teeth? Check. Read my Bible? Check. And this is not what it means to think it over. It's not what it means to think it over. We when we come to the Bible, we read about some people who thought over the Word of God, and David is one of our best examples. Um, we think about David, who, as we read in the Psalms, and he, he, talked about, he talks about the Word of God. He says, oh, I think about it. Joshua talks about it as well. Let's look at some of the scriptures from Joshua 1, 8, and 9. This was from the, these were the words of Moses. And then also from Psalm 119, which is the most wonderful psalm about the Word of God. Look at Joshua 1, 8, and 9. So step two is think it over. And what do we see here? Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night, so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. And in Psalm uh, 119, verses 97 and 99, Oh, how I love your instructions. I think about them all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are my what? 
constant guide. Yes, I have more insight than my teachers for what? I'm always thinking of your laws. Now, look at this for just a minute and I want to ask you something. When you read this, what do you think? Does it encourage you or does it overwhelm you when you look at this? How many are a little bit overwhelmed? Think about the Word of God all day long. All night long, have the Word of God rolling over and over in your brain. How many? Yes. Every waking moment, every waking thought, yay! Or, I can't do that. Some of us look at this and we think, that can't work. I'm in my office. I have to use my brain power for solving this problem. I've got to use my brain power for thinking about how I'm going to teach this. I've got to use my brain power for managing all of the people that I'm working, that, that are working under me. So when we look at these verses, some of us look at and we think, well, I can't do that. I can't do that. But I want to encourage you for just a minute this morning as we look at this. Joshua 1, 8 and 9. Psalm 119, 97 through 99. By the way, those of you in the back that are trying to see, that's the advantage of the front row, which is completely open except for Brother Stephen and Pastor Renee and usually Pastor Jennifer. So I encourage you to get a little bit closer. But I want to encourage you as to what this means. The word meditate has a special meaning. And you know what the meaning actually is? We don't use it this way these days. When we think of meditate now, we think of being very silent. We think of, of something sort of like yoga or Buddhist, Buddhism, don't we? We think you get into a dark, quiet room and there's soft music playing in the background and we're going, um. And honestly speaking, how many of us have that kind of time all throughout the day? Yes or no? No, we don't. The word meditate in the Old Testament actually means to murmur, okay? Not in a bad way, but in a good way. Okay, let's practice murmuring just a minute. Everybody, let's murmur. Everybody, let's murmur, let's murmur, 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 murmur. Okay, murmuring, that's actually, you didn't do very well on that one, but that's okay. Murmuring actually means, the idea of it is to have words in your mouth that you're just sort of saying under your breath. That's what it means to murmur. And in the Old Testament, that's what meditate means. And so when we take that and we apply it to our lives, this first one, and also this one as well, the idea that we have is this. What it means is that as you come to the Word of God, you let it become part of your life. You take some brain power all throughout the day? No! You can't all the time, unless you're a full-time pastor, but even pastors, Pastor Renee, are you thinking, are you meditating all the... No! But what it does mean is this. It means throughout my day and throughout your day, we give time and space and brain power for the Word of God all along. Maybe in the morning you get up. What's one of the verses that comes to your mind? Or you have a verse from something else. You come back to it throughout the day and it comes to your mind. Lord, I want to think about this today. And when you have a break, it comes back to mind. And you will soon find that it becomes subconsciously part of your life. Um, and another, when you think of murmuring, uh, all of you know that my background is, a, I'm a country girl. You know that, don't you? I'm a farm girl. And on our farm, on dad's farm, it's not mine, it's dad's farm, he has a most beloved creature on his farm. And you know what that is, don't you? His cows. Dad loves his cows. He loves them. He has names for most of them. He, he really does. He feeds them bread by hand almost every day and they love him. When they see him, they come running in the pasture. But if you've ever been around cows, you will see something about cows that helps us understand the idea of meditate or murmur. You will see a cow at some time in the day, most of the time, they'll be standing there in the meadow or in the pasture or whatever. All of the whole herd will be there and they won't be munching on grass at all. Do you know what they'll be doing? They'll just be standing there and what will they be doing? Do you know what they're doing? They're chewing the cud. The grass or the hay that they ate earlier in the day, they bring, I know it sounds a little bit gross, but that's how God made cows. They have four stomachs. And one of the stomachs, they bring the food after they've eaten it, they bring it back up, 
and then throughout the day, sometimes for about eight hours, they will chew on that food. They don't have to go get more from the ground. They just chew on it. It's in their mouth and they chew on it. It's called chewing their cud, okay, in case you didn't know that. And that's a picture for us of the Word of God. Be a cow, okay? <laughs> just bring it back up, okay? Bring it back up and you just kind of chew on it. You just kind of think on it. I don't think that's too hard to do. I think that's something we can do. But there's another part that goes with thinking it over, and that is memorizing as well. Now, some of you are scared. When I say memorizing, you say, <laughs> I'm too old. How many of you think I'm too old to memorize? Yeah, I, the Sister Gurley, thank you. I thought that too. But I want to give you some suggestions this morning for meditating and for memorizing. Let me show you what I do, and I want to be really practical this morning. When I first began studying Chinese, I used to get, I have, I have about 50 of these little things, and I, I still have them, although I don't use them very much anymore. And as I was learning new words, I would write it. This one's blank on the inside. I would write the word in Chinese. I'd write the character on one side, and I'd look at it because I was trying to read and write. And then on the other side, I would have the opinion, that, how to pronounce it, and then the meaning on this side. And I would, throughout the day, I'd keep one in my pocket or I'd keep it in my purse. And I'd bring, I'd bring it out, and I'd look at it, and I would just go through it whenever I had some time during the day. Do you know that I have started doing that with Scripture as well? This is one that I've just made for us. I've got some other ones at home that I use more regularly. And you can get these anywhere. And it helps you to meditate and it helps you to memorize. Put it in your back pocket. Put it in your purse and you just go through it. This one I've done, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us. And just get some verses and start writing verses that are meaningful to you. Some of you say, oh, Pastor Jennifer, you're, low, you're so low tech. Piece of paper and a pen. You don't have to do that. Get your phone and do it the same way. Me, I prefer pen and paper. But you can get a phone and do that as well. Here's another suggestion for you. Get one of these little promises of God. This is one that came from Manila, from the Philippines. And it has some of the scripture verses. They're not, it's, I will lead the blind on their journey. By paths unknown, I will guide them. I will turn darkness into light before them and make crooked ways straight. These things I do for them, and I will not forsake them. Isn't that great? And take this, and just keep it with you and just read it through. Or, if you're trying to memorize something, just get a bigger card. And this is what I've done as well. And sometimes I keep it before me. This is what Sister Betty used to do. She'd put it on her mirror in the morning as she was getting ready and she'd look at it. That's what my grandfather used to do when he was memorizing scripture as well. Keep it with you. Put it on your desk and just pick it up every once in a while. And you will find that as you take the word of God into your heart and into your life that you will be transformed. I challenge you. I challenge you. Now, some of you are not looking at me very excitedly this morning, but I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. Look at the, the next slide. Psalm 119.11. I love this. Look at some of the promises of God for those who will take God's word into their lives. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Are you struggling with temptation and sin in certain areas? Hide God's word in your heart. I reflect at night on who you are, O oh Lord. Therefore, I obey your instructions. Do you sometimes have trouble with obedience? Get God's word into your life and it will make a difference. Parents, I want to encourage you and challenge you again. Give your children some incentive to memorize the word of God. You can give them some money if you want to. I didn't always get money for memorizing, but for long passages, I did. My mother would choose which passages I was going to memorize. 23rd Psalm, John 1, Psalm 1. I, can, I could quote every single one of those right now in the King James. And I learned those when I was six years old. I can. Every single one of those. And let me tell you something. How much money did I get for that? It was in Singapore. I was a child, maybe 10 cents, <laughs> 10 cents. Or for the really long one, maybe 20 cents. What did I use to buy with that? I, have, I don't recall, I have no idea how I spent that money. It's long gone. The thing I bought is long gone. The money is long gone. But let me tell you what is still part of my life. What? 
The Word of God is still in my heart. Oh, that's a great thing. I have no problems with that, with giving your children some money to help them learn Scripture. I really, I don't. Get God's Word into their lives. Talk about it at night. We look at, um, and, and I'm so thankful for that. Look at the next slide. In Deuteronomy, and we're not going to read all of it. Here was Moses as we talk about getting the Word of God in our hearts and our lives. Moses is getting ready to leave the children of Israel. Joshua is going to take over. They're getting ready to go into the land, and they're going to have to fight for the land. Now, you know what I would do? Had I been Moses, you know what I would have done? Now, I've got to give them the battle plan, and I've got to tell them, go to the north first. Now, there are giants here, so you must do this and you must do that. Moses doesn't do that at all. What does he talk about? What does he spend his time on? He, he talks to them about loving God, and then what he says is, verse 6, commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands. Verse 7, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home, and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed, and when you're getting up. Think about that. Parents want to ask you something in your homes. What's the conversation in your homes most of the time? Or even uh, adults, you may not have children. What is the conversation in your home most of the time? Is it about the temporal things of this earth that will pass away, that one day will burn up, that will mean nothing for all eternity? There's nothing wrong with those things. We are part of this world and they are part of this world. But brothers and sisters, if our lives and our families and all of our conversations with our friends and our families are tied up with that, we're wasting the precious time that God has given us. Let the Word of God, let the commands of God, let the truths of God be part of your family, be part of your conversation, be part of your life, and watch yourself and your family and your, and your life being transformed because that is what the Word of God will do when we give it place in our lives and in our families. Imagine having a family life like that in your home. Talk about them with your children. Oh, sometimes we think, oh, my children are too young to understand. Well, bring it down to a level that they can understand. God loves you. He cares about the test that you're going to take tomorrow. Are you afraid about that? Let's pray and ask God to help you remember what you have studied. Simple things like that. Simple things like that. Bring it to a level they can understand. Don't just say, well, one day they'll learn it when they grow up. Don't just say, well, when they get to church at Lighthouse, it's a good Sunday school and they'll learn it in Sunday school. No. Parents, this is to be part of our conversation. We have a responsibility in this area. And then look at, eight, at, at number eight. So you, uh, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up, verse eight, tie them to your hands. Wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now imagine doing something like that. Look at the next picture. I want to show you something that looks a little bit unusual to us. Uh, this was a rabbi. I think he, was, uh, he has passed away now. Um, that it is, that's orthodox. Uh, he does not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He doesn't believe that Jesus has come, but he knows the Old Testament. Look what, he's, look what he did. I, I don't remember his name now. He took that command from Joshua very, very seriously, and he tied the Word of God to his hands. And you see this little box up here? It's a little bit dark. You can't quite see it. In that box, yeah, it, so unusual looking, right? In that box is, it's the Pentateuch or the the first five books, very, very small, the fir first five books of the Bible. And he's just doing what it says in Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, tying them to his hands and tying them to his forehead. And we look at this and we kind of laugh, don't we, just a little bit. It seems so unusual. But go back to the, the uh, preceding, go back to, the, to uh, Deuteronomy again. Look at what he says. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Brothers and sisters, don't you think there's a New Testament application of this Old Testament scripture? The Word of God is to be in our minds. The Word of God is to fill our days and to empower what we do because God has given us things to do that we do with our hands. Let the Word of God inform that. Let the Word of God empower what you do. Let it be part of your thinking process. Do more than just just use your bra earthly brain to make decisions. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to solve this problem this way and that way. The Word of God is applicable and practical to every part of your life, to your work. 
when you don't know when you don't know what to do pray about it go to the Word of God I've told you before about when I was in whatever grade it was and I was crying over algebra algebra and some of you engineers and others are laughing right now algebra <laughs> nothing <laughs> you know I am NOT an algebra person I'm a language person I was crying in my bedroom over my algebra homework and you know what remember this story I prayed oh God I don't understand it God I, and I was always a straight-A student and mm, I was not a straight-A in algebra I, I always wanted to get top scores and I wasn't getting an algebra but I, but I just I wanted to understand it and I still remember crying and praying God please help me God I don't know how to I don't understand it I don't I don't understand it I can't and I couldn't make X and Y and Z I couldn't figure them out <laughs> I couldn't you all laugh because you can figure it out I couldn't figure it out and I still remember as I prayed the Holy Spirit spoke to my spoke to me on the inside it impressed my heart and I turned to a scripture that I'm sure I'd read before but never had never recalled it in that way remember all scripture is given by inspiration of God it's useful right and I came to this scripture in Colossians the Lord impressed me and I turned to it in my Bible I was a young young teenager and you know what it said it talked about Jesus Christ and it said in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge <gasps> Wow, King James and I said oh Lord you understand algebra <laughs> he did and I sat back down and I started again and the Lord helped me he will help you in in your everyday life in your work life please don't separate God and his word from the real world out there brothers and sisters this is the real world this is the real world and let him help you and equip you and prepare you and empower you through his word amen, amen. that's true step so step one what do we do oh I I told you we were gonna get all the way through this we've got to okay step one uh, read it through step two think it over step three okay write it down step three write it down and this one is just very very simple step three write it down and when I say write it down do you know why I say that I'm not going to give you a scripture for that although there are plenty because of our time write it down why so that you'll remember it let me show you I've got all these little notebooks and I was talking with somebody last week and they said oh I'm a notebook person too I had it last week and we didn't get this far last week but I want to show you here are some I write I write things down I write them in my Bible but I saw I also keep notebooks and I write them down and I'll write down a scripture and then I'll say something I'll write something about the scripture oh I have something in here November 12th from 2008 six years ago almost the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Zephaniah 317. The verse the Lord gave me on my 50th birthday. How about that? How about that? Write it down. Why do we write it down? Because as clever as we think we are and as smart as our brains are, let me tell you what will happen if you don't write it down you will what forget. forget it you'll forget it so write it down write things down if the Lord impresses a verse to you and may I suggest something else if the Lord if you write a verse down don't just write the verse down but you know what else you should do write something about the verse why did you write it down the Lord spoke to me about this because you know what let me tell you what I do I used to just write verses down and you know what what would happen a month later two months later a year later I would come back to it and I'd read it and I'd think why did I write that verse <laughs> have you ever done that yes. why, why was that that doesn't mean anything write it down so get a little notebook get a big notebook use the note function on your phone but anyhow you know if you're if that's if you're an electronic person but write things down to help you remember and so that the Word of God will become more and more part of your lives so step one what do we do Step two. Step three. Okay, step four. What comes next? Step four. Pray it in. Pray it in. The book, 
that God has given us, the Bible, is not like any other book. And if you approach it with your brain, let me figure this out, you will get some things from it, but you won't get a lot. This is a spiritual book and it's going to take more than your brain. So as you come to the Word of God, pray it in. Pray it into your life. When you approach the Word of God, God, help me to understand. Lord, help me to see what I need to see in your Word this day. God, I'm reading this and I don't understand what it is. Lord, speak to my heart. And He will. Pray it into your life. Combine the Word of God with prayer. And as you do, faith will grow. Prayer with reading and meditating on God's will will transform your life. It will strengthen you. It will bring light into your life. It will cause faith to grow. It will keep your heart from getting hard. I have talked with people before and met people with before that know the Word of God so, so well. They've studied it all their lives, but they've never put a lot of prayer with it. And do you know what I have found about people like that? They tend to be very hard, very, very hard. Because the Word of God, not mixed with prayer and the work of the Holy Spirit, can get very hard for our lives, or it can make us feel very guilty if you're not praying it through and you're not praying it in. You'll read it and you'll think, Oh, I can't do that. Oh, Lord, that's, I'm, not, I'm a terrible Christian. But as you pray, the Holy Spirit will take truth that you're reading and mix it in your heart and mix it in your life and will begin to transform you. So as you come to the Word of God, Pray it in. Don't just read it, but pray it in. Look at 2 Chronicles 20, 21 through 23, and there are many, many more. This is when Jehoshaphat was king, and the enemy was coming up against him, and the enemy, it's from 2 Chronicles 20, 21 through 23. The enemy was coming up, and it was an enemy far greater than they, than they were. They were sure to be defeated. I want you to look at this and see what it says. It says... They appointed singers to walk ahead of the army, singing to the Lord and praising Him for His holy splendor. Look at what they sang. How would you like to sing this song? What is the song? Sing it. Say it with me. Give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. Well, where did those words come from? They're the words of Scripture. They're the words of Scripture. They're Psalms. They're Psalms. And what happened as they began to pray Scripture, as they began to pray the words of God? What happened? At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord's, Lord caused the armies to start fighting among themselves. Brothers and sisters, if your prayer life is weak and wimpy and you run out of words after two minutes, how many of you run out of words after two minutes? You just don't know what to pray and don't know how to pray it? Maybe, sometimes, I encourage you, go to the Word of God. Well, where? Well, Psalms is a good place to go. And begin to pray the Word of God. The Word of God. Sometimes when I'm praying, I often, I pray in English. I pray in tongues. And I pray for a while. And then sometimes I will go to the Word of God. And I'm not trying to be... I'm not trying to be fancy or spiritual. I'm really not. I'm just telling you what I do sometimes. And often, especially when I go to the Word of God, I'll often just get on my knees because for me it seems appropriate. And I'll go to the Psalms and I'll go to verses that are appropriate. And you know what? I'll just begin to, I'll just begin to pray Psalms with my eyes open because I have to read it. And I'll begin to say, Oh, I'll say, Oh, God is our refuge and strength. Psalm 46. An ever-present help in trouble. And you know what I'll do? I'll change it because it's my prayer. It's not David's prayer anymore. It's coming out of my mouth. It's coming from my heart. So you know what I'll do? Psalm 46. God, you are my refuge. You are my strength. You are my ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, I will not fear, though the earth around me is giving way. And I make it personal. And I make it mine. And I want to challenge you. Pray it in to your life and watch the difference in your prayers. And when you begin to pray the Word of God, anybody who has done this will tell you this. Your faith begins to grow and your confidence begins to rise. Yes, as you begin to pray the Word of God. Why? Because it's truth. It's truth. And truth always overcomes the enemy. Truth always overcomes lies and the lies of the enemy as he attacks you and tries to, to make you to stumble. So pray it in. Come to the Word of God. So, we're going to keep, we're going to make it all the way to the end. So number one, what do we do? Number two, 
Number three? Number four? Okay. Number five. What comes next? Number five? Live it out. Live it out. It's not enough to take it in. It's got to transform our lives and and show itself through us. So step five, live it out as you come to the Word of God. You've heard Pastor Renee preaching from Revelation, haven't you? Revelation uh, From Revelation 1, verse 3. Look at this. Um, and I want to give you an example here. Second... Well, actually, there are not two books of Revelation. I'm sorry. I'm, not, I, I'm teaching false doctrine now. Uh, I, was, I was preparing this slide late last night. There's only... One, there's only one revelation, <laughs> okay, of God. So erase it. Uh, cut that from the, from the tape, <laughs> okay? <laughs> revelation, this is why you should bring your Bibles. <laughs> one, verse three. You've heard Pastor Renee preaching from the book of Revelation, right? Look what verse three says. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and what? Obey what it says, for the time is near. If we want to receive the full blessing of God as we come to His Word, we've got to live it out. We've got to obey. You know, when you look at this, in the early church, there were very few people who had any portion of scriptures. It, at that time, it was extremely precious, extremely rare. It would usually have been written on animal skins of some sort, sheepskin or, or, or something else. And very few people had any portion of scripture. But beyond that, many were illiterate as well. And so when John writes this, he's writing to people that would have been in that situation. And here when it says, God blesses the one who reads the word of this prophecy to the church, he was addressing their situation. This word in the Greek, read, actually means to read aloud. And what they would have done, uh, that's, why, that's why Paul says to Timothy in another place, Paul, uh, Timothy, until I come, devote yourself to the reading of Scripture, okay, in the church. Because that was the only way most people would receive the Word of God. And so there would be someone in the church, usually they were trained or appointed, and they would stand and they would read portions of scripture to the church and people would sit and listen. Think about how careless we are sometimes when we come to the Word of God. So careless, right? How many of us ever when somebody, when there's a long portion of scripture, honestly, we just kind of tune out, right? We do, don't we? It's a long portion. We kind of click off and we'll, we'll, I'll wait till he starts preaching again. I'll wait till she gets back to something a little more interesting. That was, that was not the picture of the early church. This was their only chance to hear and to receive the Word of God. So it's read aloud. But John, inspired of the Holy Spirit, says he blesses all who listen and obey. And that's where the greatest blessing of the Lord will come into your lives. When you listen to the Word of God and then you live it out. When you obey. He knew they were going to need the truth and he knew they were going to have to, they were going to have to it as a have it as a foundation very soon, for the time is near. So to listen and to obey, not just to listen, but to listen and to obey. Uh, Pastor Renee and I, you know, and the whole group of us, we were recently in the Philippines, and we were up in the mountains with the Atas tribe. And um, I still remember, I'm so glad Pastor Renee asked that question. We were sitting with Chief Amado of the Atas tribe, and Pastor Renee asked him, how will you evangelize? How will you share the gospel with the other tribe? Because there, were, there was another tribe of Atus in the area who had not received the gospel, who had not heard. And remember what he said? Chief Amado said, oh, we will take the Bible and our Bible reader and we will go to the other tribe and we will read the Bible to them. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? Uh, there may be just one or two people in that tribe that are literate. I think Chief Amado's wife could read just a little bit, but not much. But the, the man in the tribe is sort of the midwife for the tribe, Brother Carlito. And Brother Carlito can read. And he's the one that reads scriptures to them. And so Chief Amado said, we will take Brother Carlito, we'll go to the other tribe, and we will read to them. Being blessed in the reading of the word and how often we take for granted. How often we take for granted. James 1, 20, oh, chapter 1, 22 through 25, so, so practical. And I'm, I, am, I, I do want to finish up today because there's, there's still something, a video I want to show us this morning. On your own, would you study this? I love this. James, James 1, 22 through 25. 
So, so practical. You know, sometimes we get really, really spiritual, don't we? Do you ever get really spiritual? Woo! James, the half-brother of Jesus, who didn't even believe in Jesus until after he rose from the dead, wrote this. And he was so practical. And he said, don't just listen to God's word. What? You must do what it says. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. Oh, brothers and sisters, we don't want to fool ourselves because if we listen, if you hear this morning, if you say, well, that was really good, Pastor Jennifer, but you don't do what it says, you're fooling yourself and you will be the loser. If I listen and I don't do, I'll be the loser because the blessing comes in listening and obeying. I've got to live it out. You've got to live it out. It's like a mirror. Remember? What we read at the very beginning from uh, from Second Timothy, the word, uh, the, what the word of God is, it shows us what is wrong. How many of you got up and looked at yourself in the mirror this morning? Ooh, my hair sticking up. I've got to comb my hair. I've got to do this. You saw what was wrong with yourself, and you, but and then you fixed it, right? And yet we come to the word of God and we see ourselves, and so often we just put it down and we walk away, living it out. Let's the word of God do its work in, in our lives and it will set us free. Ah, the law of God will set us free. So number one. Number two. Number three. Number four. Number five. Number six. Here comes the last one. Pass it on. Pass it on. What you read, what you learn, how God is transforming your life through obedience to His truth. Share it with others. Share it with others. It can be something small. You say, oh, no, 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 Pastor Jen. I'm not a preacher. I am. Oh, I'm not a preacher. Can you share a verse? Can you share what God did in your life? Can you share something? Oh, I was so worried, and I read this in the Bible, and it encouraged my heart. And share it with someone. We are called to pass it on. And that, and when we do, when we do, you know what happens? The other person is blessed. And what happens to us when we share the truth of God? What happens? We are refreshed. We are strengthened. We are convinced even more, aren't we? When, you know, as pastors, I preach and I pray the word in this church to see you become more Christ-like and fulfill God's purposes in your life, your calling. That's why I pray for you. That's why, I, that's why I preach the word as I do. And I find great joy in that. When I see in your lives change and transformation, I, I love that. Do you know what brings me even more joy? What brings me even more joy is not that you come to me and say, oh, Pastor Jen, that was good, or I really appreciate that. I love it even more when I see your life, there's transformation, and then instead of going this way, you go that way and you share it with others and you bring it to others. That's when I say, they're really growing. And when you begin to do that, that's when your roots go down and that's when you start getting stronger and stronger in the Lord. And whether it is in Philippines, oh, what joy we have from Pastora Mayette, from Amor, from Rena, from Julia, from Susan, from all of these who have done just that. Or in China, or here in Hong Kong, at McDonald's, or in our homes. That is part of the process, to pass it on, to pass it on. And I'm going to skip the other verses, but I'll give them to you, because we're going to end with two short videos this morning. Look at 2 Timothy 1. Uh, sorry, yeah, let's just show slide 18 very quickly. Very quickly. Uh, this is 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. And he says, teach these truths to others. And then the next slide as well. I'm going fast. He says, Timothy, remember your grandmother Loss and your mother Eunice. Hey, Christians, parents, do you have that type of tradition, Christian tradition in your family? If you don't, you can. You say, I don't have children. Do you have friends? You can, be, you can have this same tradition. And then look at the second passage. You must remain faithful to the things you know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You've been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood and they have given you wisdom they've given you wisdom you pass it on every one of us every one of us has a sphere of influence every one of us you say I don't have children you've got people that you influence every day I'm young you've got people that you influence every day you're in an office you're in a classroom you're in a family 
You're in a group. Every one of us has a place where we can pass it on. I want to close this morning with two videos. We're going to turn off the, we'll turn off this light so you can see, just as an encouragement. You say, oh, Pastor Jen, I'm ready to go. Hang with me. You're going to be encouraged. You're going to be encouraged. And these two videos put together, if you need to go, that's okay. You can go, but you don't want to leave. You want to be here for this. These two videos are from China and from Indonesia. And they are about the Word of God. The, the first one I'll give you just to, as it goes, it's in Mandarin, so I'll give you just a real short translation as it goes. Uh, we'll have it in Chinese. But it brings together everything that we've talked about, six steps to getting the most out of your Bible. And, and some of the, the first one you've probably seen before, it's been on YouTube and on Facebook, but probably some of you have not yet seen it. It will bless your heart. It will bless your heart. And it's a picture from rural, it's, it's a video from rural China of Christians receiving their own copy of a Bible for the first time. Ready? Okay. <laughs> How do we feel about the Word of God? How do we feel about the Word of God? And the second video is a little bit longer. Both of these, there are longer. You can go to YouTube. The second one is from the island. It's one of the Indonesian islands of Guinea. And it is West Guinea, the Kimyal tribe, K-I-M-Y-A-L. There's a much longer thing on YouTube if you want to see it. The video is from 2010. And it is when they were receiving for the first time in their own language the New Testament. Missionaries first went there in the early 60s and two of the first missionaries, the husbands that were there, were killed. They were cannibal tribes and a tribe killed two of the husbands and the wives left but others came, other missionaries came and took their place and you will hear as you look at this, uh, you'll see, I think his name is Say, Say, Sayed, I, I, I can't quite pronounce it, he was one of the first Christians in the tribe and he was one of the first, he's one of the first local pastors of the tribe from a small mountainous area, the smallest tribe on this island, the Kimyal tribe receiving the Bible. Darana nyundi yuda ibna gigit memero. Dara memero kum. O yonanga nyundi gerenche omulatlam si yang wenena. Memero puku wenena ot kemilama. Do wene ane si ane yak lemla buka nyundi be elu lama. Puk memero kum ni omulatlam si yang wenena. Oni nyundi be kete po. Seni lima po. Sum ni wenena nyundi ibu nisin. Mati utsampe wahyu. Gigit ang kalu wenena. Wala yok sum na.
nani miyong kiblam nuna po ka nayo kumbo nedi masarakat miyong mabon ni sinap di sini miyong sa ngingin ulam opti na ngingin ulam niyo mo nedi higin na kikip lawa piyo pertanyan lama aparo sa ngina dan ngingin lam nungo nene kana kikip pesarok pesing ding kayo Ani mungkin tu nak buat nanti tak siapa nunggu yang opsi nunggu dia alkitab pada waktu itu ambusin benda dia buat apa waktu itu mungkin dia ular opni di sini nunggu dia buat apa nunggu na yang kena itu apa? Kalau tu bisa puluhan nuna, ingin ulung, mungkin siapa yang kau bapak nak ulung, ingin ulam siyo, tu mungkin siapa yang bapak nak deli bob, kami na, anda semua nunggu ulam bob kumpul. Sunnah na, mewung di mewung sukar sunnah bisi kubu ka, mewung di ibu nenem, membib siang, malu nene di mana dah lebih siang sunnah na, sembib no, tinggi yang ulam neo. Siga ane sunnah mi, ane sunnah mi na, eh, mewung di ibu, gimi al ibu rahat memeru bangi, nundi seri doa bipu nena. Nudi mabu muk mabak depsi, tinun malu kalau jumpa gak, so malu gak. Kalau nene nudi ibrahim nene ke sal baik dok. Tinun di mabak tak sih, sih tina sih telim sih mabak nene ke, ambat tak bagam sih, sih gak nudi nak nasun, ima sal minggu gak sembia sih babi. Nak dalam na, sum na, emi yang nak na yang apa? Iblam na, apa sih? Di mana dia ayu na ni ke lak dep ni ya sih? Di mana dia na ni ke na? Wena ya aku dep na aku, di mana dia na na dia jala aku buka sampai pokok tak nak orang bela. May we treasure and love the Word of God and take it into our lives. Oh, one day we're going to get to heaven and the Kimyal tribe, I hope they don't say to us, you were so fortunate. You had it. You had it all this time. We just got it. But may we treasure what God has given us. May we treasure it. May we take it into our lives. May their joy upon receiving the Word of God encourage us and challenge us to love his word to take it into our lives to pray it in to live it out and to pass it on to others lord we thank you this morning for your precious word to us god we thank you for this kimyal tribe that we will never meet until heaven but god one day we will meet them because of you and because of your word and because people went there and passed it on. And Lord, I pray that we may not, when we get to heaven one day, be found far, far behind having taken your word for granted because we've had it, such easy access to it. But Lord, I pray that you would help us in this church to be people of your word, that take your word, that value your word, that treasure your word, that obey your word, that pray through your word, and that share your word, and that we will be transformed thereby. Thank you for not leaving us alone and in, and in a darkened world, but that you gave us the light of your truth, the light of your life, to lead us and guide us. Thank you, Lord. God, may it make a difference in our lives. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen.